Okay. Okay, good, good. Well, let's get started. This is uh, class seven. Let's open up with a word of prayer. And then we'll, we'll get started. Father, we come to you again. We are just grateful for this time each week. Thank you for these precious men and for their love for your word and their love for you. Uh, thank you that you have given us uh, the privilege of being able to study your word, that you've actually called us in, into your work. What, a, what an incredible, incredible privilege that is. And uh, tonight as we study, we don't want to take any of that lightly. These things are important and uh, they have value to the ministries that you have given to each of us. And so we pray that you would strengthen us, that you would guide us uh, as, we, as we study these different terms. Uh, I know we're not studying the Bible as such, but we are studying how to study the Bible. And so that's critical to the ministries that you have placed us in. We love you deeply, Father. We uh, just want to pray, especially for our one brother, uh, just the issues that he's had with his church. And we pray that you would continue to bless him and be an encouragement to him and his family, that they'd be strengthened, Lord, during the trial. We know that uh, the iron is strengthened in the fire. And so uh, we, we know that on the other side, uh, that, you will, that you will strengthen him mightily in yourself. We love you now and we commit ourselves to you afresh tonight in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, we're going to pick up with our terms. The next term that we're going to study is the term perspicuity. I always have uh, trouble pronouncing that word, P-E-R-S-P-I-C-U-I-T-Y. I'm not sure I can even spell it good. Perspicuity. And what this uh, particular principle uh, uh, states, and I think this is a very important to hermeneutics, it states that the basic message of Scripture itself is clear enough uh, for even the most unlearned and the most ignorant people to understand. It has a clarity at a very fundamental root, basic level uh, where the individual can actually understand the, the, the message of salvation that Scripture provides. There may be other doctrines that they don't understand, uh, you know, that somebody may, they may not fully understand Romans or Galatians, they may not understand anything about the Gnostics in 1 John, because that word's not even used, but still the message that's there is clear enough for somebody that doesn't have all the tools and all the uh, background study material that we have and all of that, the computers, somebody that's out in the bush, you can still give them a Bible and they can understand, they can understand uh, in, in a simple way the basic truths of Scripture. This does not mean that every part of Scripture is clear and it's understandable to anybody that reads it. It's not. I have trouble with Ezekiel, and I've read it many times. You know, and the wheels upon wheels, and the eyes, and these creatures, and what all of that means. I honestly, just as transparent as I know how to say it, I don't have any clue. I don't have any idea, even though I've taught on that book in a, in a survey type course. And I taught on it very quickly, uh, because it's just, there's a lot of stuff there that's not understandable in those in that symbolic use of language that, uh, that Ezekiel used. Um, so I think when the concept of uh, perspicuity is utilized, it's not, a, it's not a theological principle that just allows anybody to sort of unlock the true meaning of a passage or to handle the scriptures properly. That's not the purpose of this term. The term is that God can speak to anybody through the scriptures relative to salvation and some of the other fundamental uh, elements of the Christian life without having to have uh, three doctorate degrees or having gone to a seminary. Uh, 
I think that, uh, you know, at different times when I've gone, uh, say, to Indonesia, the Philippines, or say, Africa, that I could give a Bible in somebody's language to somebody and believe that they could understand the basic message of that, of, of the scriptures without me necessarily being there to teach them. They certainly may not understand all of the information that that, that they would read, but they still have could have a general understanding of salvation and and how that salvation is provided to us. So I think that the I think if we were just wanted to, to just to just uh, condense this meaning of perspicuity, it's simply that God has designed the scriptures in such a way that it's clear and understandable. To the person that needs to understand it, and uh, I think I think that's a true way of, of, of saying it to the most simple of readers. I, I don't think that you can use this principle uh, to abuse the idea of learning, of academics, and some people have done that. There, I think there are certain denominations that have that tendency that you don't need anything but the Bible uh, and the Holy Spirit. I've heard that many times. I think that's a fallacy and. A person's uh, uh, there's there's nothing there's nothing in the scriptures that would warrant somebody actually actually saying that that you don't need academics and you don't need good scholarship in the interpretive process you do and and that's why we're here right that, that's why we're in school that's why we study that's why we take these kind of, of, of courses the next uh, term I want you to write down is authorial intent, A-U-T-H-O-R for author, I-A-L, author, 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 authorial, authorial intent. Um, this uh, particular term is defined as what the author intended to say to his audience when he wrote it. It's really a very simple principle. And I, I think from authorial intent, and there's a lot of, in the new hermeneutic, there's a tremendous amount of debate. We're going to, we're, uh, when we get through uh, chapter 3, uh, we're, and we're going to start with chapter 4, we're going to be looking at, let me see if I can just tell you exactly, uh, we're going to be looking at um, uh, some issues that come out of the new hermeneutic, syncretism, things of that nature. I had a whole list of them here. I forget where I put them. Um, and uh, 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 postmodernism, uh, how to uh, properly apply textual criticism to the study process, those, those kind of things. And so authorial intent is one of those areas that's being challenged today. Uh, such that it's not what the author intended, it's, it's how the passage, how you personally relate to the passage. That kind of becomes more the governing, the governing thrust of, of the criticism of, of this, this thing. But we will look at another term li uh, a little bit later, but I think they're almost synonymous, uh, called intended meaning. And I, and I think that is exactly what authorial intent is. It's the intended meaning that the, that the writer uh, intended for his audience to understand. That's, he, he wrote it, and that's what he intended them to know. Can there be a double meaning to it? There can be, uh, uh, just simply because there are places where, where the Holy Spirit has revealed a double meaning. But we've mentioned it previously that the double meaning is something that cannot be, um, the, it has to be revealed in the scripture that it's a double meaning. You cannot get the double meaning from the author's intended meaning when you do the grammatical research and all the exegesis of the words and you're not going to find double meanings. The words mean what they mean and they don't have a double meaning. So. I think that's where a lot of a, a lot of the controversy uh, uh, comes from. Some uh, there, there there's some theologians that call this the intended meaning. What we talked about just earlier, and there are uh, 
some that call it the specific meaning that the author was trying to convey, intended meaning, specific meaning. But what we have to appreciate, and this is the difficulty for us as teachers, is that what somebody hears and what somebody understands that you said may be quite different than what you intended for them to hear. I think that happens quite frequently where you you may say something and somebody hears it maybe the way that they want to hear it, but not the way that you intended for them to hear it. And so in, in this, uh, in, in this, under this term, there are three primary areas uh, for consideration, and, and I want you to write these down, these three areas. This is under authorial? Yeah, under authorial intent. Uh, and and there, there, there are three different areas. I, I don't mean to be uh, just sort of repeating myself here, but the first is what the author actually intended in a text. What did he intend in the text when he wrote it? What was he actually trying to convey? The second, which I think is, is the only way that you can determine that, all right, initially, is what is the textual, the lexical, and the grammatical meaning of the text? What is it? Uh, you know, you go out, you, you, you get your dictionary, you look up the parsing of the word, you look up the, the, the case of the noun, you, you study a participle, uh, you know, in a certain way, you, you look at the conjunctions, uh, you look at the clauses, you come up with what is the meaning of those words. Uh, syntax, we're going to study about syntax. Syntax has a great deal to do uh, with how how you translate something because there is no word for word translation you, you cannot come up with a word for word translation from one language to any other language there, there's not a another language that is just a it gives you a full word for word translation in in that language so this, this, this is the technical side of the, the authorial intent. You, you got to do all the lexical examination and find out the grammatical meaning. And then the third, which I just mentioned earlier, the third area is how does somebody perceive the meaning of the text? I think that you could study a text, you could teach on it, and, and uh, and people come up with the exact opposite meaning that you intended it, even based on what you said. Uh, so there's there's no guarantee in in my mind that these three elements can 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 necessarily be aligned. Uh, in other words, you can't just say, well, uh, that you know, just because I think I understand what the author intended and I've done all the technical study that everybody's going to understand it the same way that I do. If you're a good teacher, maybe you can align those things, right? I mean, if you take the time, um, uh, maybe everybody can come to the same conclusion you do. And, and, that, and that, I think that would be the goal that we would have as, as teachers. But I think it's critical that the student appreciate that the goal of the interpreter, you're, you, you are the interpreter in this, in, in this process, is that the goal of the interpreter is that you have to first of all clearly understand what the author intended when he wrote it. You can't teach something that you don't understand yourself. If you don't understand what the author intended and you haven't, you haven't taken the time, you just read a commentary or something, you may not have any clue as to what the author actually intended when he, when he wrote his text. And so you cannot become creative with the text. I think that is a taboo, that's a no-no, that's a don't do it type thing. You cannot become creative with the text uh, and give it a meaning that the author never intended for it to have. But this happens all the time in the interpretive process. I think this is a, almost normal. It should be incredibly abnormal in the interpretive 
uh, work and in the interpretive process, but it's not. It, it's not. It's something that has become the norm for people that are not, that don't do the academic research, that don't do the technical research that they need to. They, they implode a meaning onto the text that the author never intended for it to have. So, in essence, when they do that, they have misdefined, they have mishandled that, that, that particular text. So I think the ultimate issue that arises under this topic, and this is where all of the debate comes, is whether or not a text can have more than one meaning, you know, whether, whether or not it can have a secondary meaning. And my encouragement to you would be uh, to just have a mindset that says, no, it can't have a secondary meaning when you're studying it. When you're reading it, uh, we were studying some passages out of Exodus tonight and out of Genesis, and and they only have one meaning. Uh, you don't you don't look for a second meaning. You go to the lexicon, you go to the uh, dictionaries, uh, you go to the grammar books, the Greek grammar or the Hebrew grammar, whatever, and you find out what those words mean, and that that becomes the meaning of of, of it. That might not. It may have multiple implications that don't come out of the meaning. You know, it's like the it's like the it's like the verse that we used in Ephesians 5:18 about you know do not be drunk with wine. That has many implications today, and so uh, I don't think Paul would just necessarily use the word wine today. You know, he may use liquor, or beer, or pot, or dope, or something. You know. If he was saying it, 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 it would be the same thing. So, having said that, you are going to come to a place where the scriptures is going to tell you that it does have a secondary meaning. But I would say that that's only like, I would say it in a positive way, that 99.9% .9 of the time, it's only going to have one meaning. It, it may be more than that. It may be 99.99. .99. Um, so it's going to. That's the. It's only going to have one meaning. So don't be. Don't be looking for a double meaning. You know. Don't be looking for a secondary meaning. Just find the meaning, and then that's what you're going to use to begin to do your exposition and your teaching from. And so, I think for those people that are always looking for the secondary meaning, that that's a very dangerous. That's a very dangerous approach to the scriptures because they are going to wind up reading secondary meanings into it just because they want to be creative with the text. And, and, and to me, at that point, it kind of becomes, I'm, I won't say they're necessarily a false teacher, but it becomes false teaching. And I think that's the critical thing. Uh, I think some people are always trying to find some kind of hidden meaning that's just not there. It's just not there. Uh, I, I think the meaning it's really very simple and we have to simplify it. We cannot be looking for some deeper, fuller, hidden, uh, more expansive meaning than what, than what is really there. Uh, I think that's a very dangerous, uh, the, it's not what the author intended and it's certainly not what the author understood when he, when he wrote it. Uh, I would say that the majority of the time that the secondary meanings, I, I don't want to make this uh, um, an all-in statement, but I would say that, that the majority of the time they're, they're going to be in the New Testament. If somebody's going to quote an Old Testament passage and then the Holy Spirit is going to reveal that it has a secondary, it has a secondary meaning. Um, and there, there, there are a number of examples of that, that, that when we get to this later on in the study, we'll go through those proof texts. So, um, the author, when he wrote that, never had that in mind. And I think that's our key, is that the author never had a double meaning in mind. He, he, never, he, he never had something that he didn't say, but he knew that, that he didn't say it, but... Uh, he, he had one meaning when he, when he wrote it, and that's the, that, that's the authorial, authorial uh, in, intent that the author had. So, 
uh, I, I think if I think what we have to appreciate is that if the Holy Spirit has in fact embedded a secondary meaning into the text, which he certainly can do if he wants to, and I think he has done that in a number of occasions, that there's no method of exegesis. You know, there's no method of exegesis, no traditional method of exegesis, there's no grammatical method, there's no critical method of hermeneutical interpretive principles whereby you can discern that secondary meaning because the words are not going to reveal it to you. Uh, it has to be revealed in the scriptures by the Holy Spirit. He has to reveal it in the scriptures, not to you. He has to reveal it in the scriptures themselves. And I think that is that is what is known as the what we would call the primary Protestant position of the fuller meaning, which and the technical term for that is sensus planor, uh, a fuller meaning, a deeper meaning, a secondary meaning, uh, another additional meaning uh, of the text. And so the, the the traditional Protestant position is that you cannot find that in a normal exegesis of the passage. It's just not there. Now, I, I think, unfortunately, that any teacher can manipulate a text, right? Say what they want it to say. They may never say what it actually says, and they use it as a proof text for whatever they want to teach on. And uh, they have biases, they have prejudices, they have presuppositions, they have their theological grid, they have all of these things that enter into the interpretive process. And I would say, for all of our benefit, that none of us can eliminate that. I can't eliminate my background. What I can do is I can refine it. You know, I can, that's why we come to school. Let's say, for instance, uh, you were a pastor and you had never been in, the, in school and you had uh, a way of teaching and your methodology of study and, and you, you just did that for years and years and years and then, then all of a sudden you decided that you wanted to go to school and you learned something about hermeneutics and that, and, and, and that study of hermeneutics began to refine your process and to make some changes for you uh, in that process. So that's the, way that, that's the way that my theological grid and my prejudices and my biases have to be changed is through an academic process uh, where, where I can see, I can learn, I can understand uh, other methodologies that are going to give me a clear understanding, a more accurate understanding of a passage than I may previously have been able to acquire. So uh, that's why having a very foundational her hermeneutic is so critical to the interpretive process. We have to have a place to start and we have to have rules and principles that are going to kind of guide us in this. I, I, I think, I think what, what I'm saying in all that is that when we have, if we wanted just to call it a, an, uh, an exegetical, hermeneutical foundation, it's going to take the subjectivity out of the process. I'm here to take the subjectivity out of the process. I cannot fully remove it for you. There will always be some level of subjectivity at times, but 99% of the time we, we, we do not want to have subjectivity in our interpretation of a passage. We don't want it to be arbitrary. We don't want it, well, I just think that's what it means. I don't want to ever say to my congregation, I think this is what it means. If I don't know what it means, I'd rather say I don't know what it means. I'm a lot safer right there. Uh, I can say my opinion is, and that can be dangerous as well, you know, especially if they accept my opinion and it's wrong. Uh, so I, I think that this is a, a, an approach that has to be, it has to be systematically grounded. That there has to be, it has to be grounded in some kind of uh, hermeneutical system that you have, some kind of approach as to how you're going uh, to come to the scriptures. It, 
So your approach to the scriptures cannot be indiscriminate, it can't be arbitrary, it can't be subjective, it can't be capricious. You know, you just, you, you just, this, this night, you know, you just feel like you get just some great revelation from God. You probably didn't. You know, the Holy Spirit may have illuminated you to some degree on a passage that you didn't understand, but uh, the words still mean what they mean, right? Any kind of illumination I, I, I get is not going to change the. It's not going to change the meaning of the words. The word. I mean, when we said it last week, the meaning of the words never change. They never change. Uh, the meaning of the text it never changes. It's it's you know 9/11 is never going to change, right? It's a historical fact. So that, that's a, we, we'll study a little bit more on authorial intent and census of the norm. And that's the next, that's the next uh, term that we want to look at, census planor. Uh, you spell it P-L-E-N-O-I-R. It's a Latin term, and it refers to a fuller meaning. Uh, uh, Walter Kaiser defines, defines this term as the view that passages of Scripture contain a meaning or meanings intended by God in addition to the meaning intended by the human author. And I, I think that's accurate, but I, I think that what we have to say, rather than just taking it the way that he quoted it, I would say it, I, I would add to that definition only certain passages of Scripture contain a secondary meaning. And he identifies those for us. They, every one of those passages that have a sense of planor to it, that have a, an additional meaning, a secondary meaning, they will be identified for us in the scriptures. Uh, if, it's, if it has a secondary meaning, the scriptures are going to provide that for us. And so we would add to that, I think you would add to that definition that this fuller meaning, this census planor, this additional meaning was not and could not have been understood by the original audience that the writer was writing to, to whom he was writing. Uh, it could not have been understood by them at that particular time. But, but it's always revealed in Scripture. Right, right. So, so like the thing where Paul mentions Hagar and Sinai mm -hmm. and not like that? Is it? Sure, sure. I mean, in Galatians uh, uh, 5, that's a, uh, is it 5 or 4 there? Yes. It's Galatians 4. Uh, oh, I, I, I mean, that's a great example of that. That's probably, for me, the most difficult passage I've ever taught, taught on in the New Testament. Is there about, you know, Hagar's Mount Sinai? I, I have no idea what that really means. I mean, I think I do, but it's not, it, it, it's, it's still a very, very difficult passage. To, to understand. Um, that's not to say that it's actually a fuller meaning of an Old Testament quotation. It's some additional information that Paul gives to us. Right? Understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yes, I guess. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, typology or something there. It could be. It could be a typology. I didn't, I, I think when I taught it, I didn't uh, use it as typology, but. I didn't think about that one for a while. So I, I want to read you something that I think really seems to capture. This is by a guy by the name of Donald, Donald Hagner, and and uh, you can just listen. These these would be in your in your notes. He says to be aware of census planor is to realize that there is the possibility of more significance to an Old Testament passage than was consciously apparent to the original author, and more than can be gained by strict grammatico historical exegesis. That, that's a good statement. You, you cannot, you, 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 you cannot just by doing your grammatical historical exegesis determine the meaning, the, the, the secondary meaning. He says, such is the nature of divine inspiration that the authors of scripture were themselves often not conscious of the fullest significance and final application of what they wrote. The fuller sense of the Old Testament can be seen only in retrospect and in the light of the New Testament fulfillment. That's a very good, I mean, it's in your notes. So 
that's a very, very good uh, <coughs> definition of the characteristics of census planora. I mean, I think that's, I think it's very good. So, but you can just imagine for a little bit, you, you can just use your imagination as to where people have actually taken this, uh, this idea of, and because it, it, this is one of those areas of scripture that, this is one of those areas of scripture that I think can easily be abused. I am a proponent of the historical grammatical approach. What did it mean to the audience to whom it was written? What did those words mean? Right? With the caveat that if God wanted it to have a double meaning, that they did not know that he could provide that for them. So, I think the issue that arises, even when you discuss census planor, is that when we just accept that there can be a double meaning, that there can be a, a, a fuller meaning in a passage, what that does is that it sort of opens up Pandora's box. It opens up a door, a doorway that people walk through uh, where they have all kinds of what I would consider to be erroneous interpretations and therefore erroneous applications and they would have what I would this is where eisegesis where they would have a, a, a lot of eisegetical type type approaches to to a passage uh, and I think that's what happens and I think that's where the whole controversy of census planor that's what surrounds it is that people have abused it they have they they are giving Passages of scripture, I think this happens in the charismatic realm a lot, uh, where some of these guys are, are giving meanings to the to the scriptures that it never have. It's like it's like the hundredfold principle, you know, that um, Kenneth Copeland's wife started, and they just use words, you know, and and they give it a meaning that the passage never never had. But they would be willing to use the census planor as a as a as a reason for that. They probably don't even know what it means, but I think that they would be willing to do that kind of stuff. So the problem with the double meaning that somebody gives it. Did you have a question? No, I was just going to say the question that automatically come in my mind what what they would probably say too is how many. I mean, who knows how much time elapses between these? You know what I mean? No. Like from the Old Testament to the New Testament, obviously there was a couple of years, so something they take stuff out of the New Testament too and right. butcher it like you don't. Well, so who gets to say, you know? If if you <laughs> have a position that the scripture can have a fuller meaning than what is apparent on the, then the problem with that, it, and 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 I, and I think this is the whole issue is that there's no legitimate way to biblically validate that. There's no biblical validation of that. It's just somebody's idea. And so if the words, if, 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 if there's no words, if the meaning of the words don't mean that, then you can't, if that's eisegesis, you cannot add that meaning to it. So I think the only safeguard that we have to this issue of a, a fuller meaning is that the fuller meaning can only be expressed it, it, it can only be it has to be provided to us by God later on in, in another passage generally in, in, in the New Testament mm -hmm. William Klein who's the author of our, of, of our one of the authors of our textbook our primary textbook he states the issue this way Along with the literal sense intended by the human author, the Holy Spirit may encode. I'm not sure I like that word. Uh, that was a that word kind of caught me a little bit off guard because I really uh, I really like our textbook. May encode a hidden meaning not known or devised at all by the human author. I think, but I think I understood understand what he's saying. I, I think 
I, I, I don't think I'd use the word encode. I, I think that Holy Spirit may give or may provide a, uh, an additional meaning that was not understood by, by, by the author. Yes? There's, there's a lot of uh, scripture in the New Testament that refers to stuff that David wrote in the Old Testament. Do you think David knew about Christ? I think he had some understanding of the Messiah, but his 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 uh, understanding was probably much different than the Christ that we know. Right. Okay. You know, he he thought he was going to be an earthly king, and he will be one day, but not initially. So he never saw the church. Right. They, he never saw the church. The, the church was just unknown to the Old Testament saints. Inconceivable to him, probably. It it, it was. So. Um, so the issue that we have to deal with in, in this debate is, and this is the real issue, is whether or not all of Scripture has the potential for a full meaning. And I think the answer to that has to be an absolute, uh, emphatic no, that it doesn't, and it, and because God hasn't revealed it to us, and so we cannot, we don't have the right just to read into it. And so I, I think it's really easy if you just use your imagination where this idea of deeper meaning, fuller meaning, hidden meaning, secondary meaning, where that can lead in the interpretive process. And it's, it's incredibly, incredibly dangerous. However, that doesn't mean that we have the right to ignore those places where God uses it. Uh, you know, it's like in Acts chapter 2 where Peter's doing his sermon. He said, this is what was spoken of by the Holy Spirit, you know. And he quotes a passage there about your young men will see dreams and, and enjoy. Uh, you know, you wouldn't have gotten that. You would not have received that from just reading the passage in Joel. Uh, you know, when you study that, you know, when we get to that in biblical theology, uh, you know, we get to Joel, you, there's no way that the author intended it, it to be the day of Pentecost. You know what I'm saying? Some fulfillment that was that came true on the day of Pentecost. He had no idea what the day of Pentecost was. He didn't certainly didn't have an understanding of what the Holy Spirit was going to do on that day. So yes. But do you think the um, New Testament authors, um, you know, in writing Paul and so forth, and they're quoting the Old Testament and they're giving the census for more? Is it? Uh, are they using their um, interpretive? Methodology to interpret the Old Testament passage using their principles, whatever they were, or, or in, in, in devising that meaning from their hermeneutic, if you will, or, or is the Holy Spirit giving them something that not even their contemporaries could have uh, gained from that? I think it would have to be the latter. I think it's just it's a Holy Spirit born impulse for them that they that they wrote. Uh, but I don't, I, I don't think that they could. I, I think under the my and and I think it's a great question because I've, I've I've had to think about it myself. But I've thought that under under the conditions, let's say let's take the Acts chapter two passage again. Peter is there, and there's things that are happening that maybe we don't we, that aren't defined there in the scriptures for us. There's there's the moment there's the there's the there's the tongues of you know the cloven tongues of fire there's the Holy Spirit descending there's people talking and you you know and uh, and and people understanding it in their language and and uh, and at that moment there was something that happened and Luke is recording that later on and in that in his recording of it there's a good chance that Luke had had interaction with Peter, with the, you know, with the, some of the apostles that, that uh, you know, when he wrote Luke and Acts, that that just was not at that moment maybe not known, and yet God sort of revealed it to him later on, and maybe Peter could have shared it with him. I don't know. The scriptures don't tell us, and uh, it, it's just a surmise on my part. I certainly wouldn't teach it that way. I mean, I, I, I'm just giving you my opinion about it. Uh, but I think, I, I don't think it was a hermeneutical approach. That, that, to answer your question, I don't know. And I'm not exactly sure how Klein would, you know, our, our authors would, would uh, interpret that. 
um, th there's no scriptural reason why there can't be double meanings, but there's no scriptural reason for why there should be. And I think just the, the historical grammatical approach is going to limit us to secondary meanings. I mean, I mean he's, it's going to limit any secondary meanings that, that we have. We're not going to see a secondary meaning in any passage that we study. Uh, I'm not, you're not. It's only the ones that are revealed to us by, you know, by the scriptures. Um, I don't have any problem in, in uh, accepting the, that revelation. If God, if God provides it in the scriptures, that's what it is. Um, I don't know if there's any passage that has three or four meanings to it that I know of. You know, it's just a secondary meaning that, that he has given to us. Uh, I don't think that there's any conceivable <coughs> hermeneutical principle, guideline, law, rule, uh, whereby we can arbitrarily say that every passage has the potential for secondary meaning for census of Noah. Just don't see it. Just don't think that that is possible in, in the scriptures. And I, I think that that fuller, deeper meaning idea is, 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 a, is, a, is a, the whole idea of census planor is a term that has been abused. There are people who say that? Would you just say it? Yeah, yeah. I think the whole, the, every scripture has a connection. Right, well, they, I, 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 would, I, I think they would say that not every scripture does, but there is the potential for, for, for every scripture that, to, to have that, you know, that God could have had a secondary meaning. So, so at that point, uh, Larry, they become, they become the, uh, the ones that validate that. There's no way to validate the authenticity of a secondary meaning if it's not given to us in scripture. I was just going to say, just thinking about it, if, um, if, I, if I read a passage and came up with a double meaning, mm -hmm. or something, the only justification that I could have would be that God specially revealed it to me. Right? I mean, you know, right. I was reading it and God revealed it to me and I know it, so I have some knowledge that you're not privy to, or you know, mm -hmm. It's not where it's to me, and in that in that sense, it's almost like a, the, the, the canon's not closed. I mean, I could write my own. Well, the Pope uh, has done that, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I could write my own uh, my own uh, gospel or something. That's right. Because I'm saying that I've got I received some knowledge from God that's not in the Scripture, because to get that second meaning. So. Uh, just you know, let me give you an example of that. Uh, that's the guy that closes. <coughs> Uh, one of the lessons that I learned at a church before I became a pastor is I, I went to a church for a, a long time that had a a pastor that had a golden tongue. He he could he could sell ice water at the North Pole. I mean he he he, he just he just had a golden tongue and was very persuasive, but he was very unbiblical. And, and at that point in my Christian life, I didn't, I was more impressed by his oratory than I was by his theology, if he, if he you know. But, um, and, but I learned a lot through that. I, it was really good for me. It was a, it was a good, ex, it was a, it was a bad experience that God used for good. In that, I learned what not to do. And, and what not to say. And one of the things that he would say all the time, and he would say it to the congregation, and it was like, how do you, how do you, what do, what do I say against what you just said? He would say, the Lord told me. It's like, well, I don't want to just get in your face and question you, you know, but it's like, you know, God told me. And there's not a whole lot you can say to that other than probably not, <laughs> you know, probably not. If, if, if it's not in the scriptures, I, I, I'm not, I, I, I really don't want to listen to what you have to say. But there are a lot of people that do that, and they do exactly what you said. They put their, their revelation on par with scripture. 
if God said it, then it's like, it's like it becomes holy ground, you know, for him. And, uh, and that's just not the case at all. So I, I, think, I, I think what we have as our safeguard, and I know that not everybody agrees with this under the new hermeneutic, and, and we'll talk about the new hermeneutic. That's going to be one of our topics here in Lesson 4. Is that is that our protection is a historical <coughs> grammatical approach? Are there other elements that can be added to that? Certainly there are. But the historical grammatical approach is going to to push us to interpret the passage literally. That's not to say that there aren't figures of speech, hyperboles, idioms, you know, those kind of things types, all of that, that we have to recognize in the interpretive process. But the historical grammatical approach is going to force us to interpret a word based on what it was, what, what the author intended for it to mean. Whether it was Paul or whether it was Moses, it doesn't really matter. You know, uh, I honestly think, this is just my opinion, it's just an opinion, I honestly think that the New Testament is easier to put into the historical grammatical approach because we're closer to that time than we were to another 4,000 4, years back. You know, there, there's more culturally that we understand about the year uh, 100 BC, I mean AD, than we do about the year 3000 BC. And so we, I think the historical grammatical approach is a little bit easier to qualify in, in the New Testament, but it still applies to the Old Testament just as much you know, just as much. You may have to do a little bit more research. I thought it was interesting. What what was the thing you were talking about tonight about, I forget what it was about, and you said that uh, it was a passage that you studied and, and, and we had to understand something about the culture to understand the, the words. The different, uh, the different gods? So that's that's right. The different gods in Egypt. Yeah, that's right. The different gods in Egypt and and the meaning of their names and how every name was represented a, a characteristic of that of that god. I mean, if, if you don't understand that, then the word Jehovah or Yahweh may not have as much significance to you. You know, when the Israelites were saying, I mean, when Moses said, "Who's going to? Who am I going to say sent sent me?" So. I mean, that's, that's one place where the historical grammatical approach needs. We need to understand the, the context in which it was actually written. So, the, let's say it this way. Let's, let's say it in a dogmatic way, and then we we'll go to the next subject. That the Holy Spirit is the only one who can give, provide a secondary meaning. And He has to reveal that to us in, in, in the Scriptures. I think the typical Protestant position is to accept the principle of census planor, accept the principle, but to actually limit the fuller sense solely to the revel revelation that's provided in the New Testament by the Holy Spirit. Right? I accept census planor, but I want I'm going to limit it to what is what is revealed by the Holy Spirit in, in the New Testament. All right, the next term is dual authorship. Uh, you know, there's debate about certain books. Uh, you take Isaiah. Was it, I remember when I taught on Isaiah um, in the survey course, this was one of the, one of the areas that we worked uh, with at some length. Some people say it has one author, two authors, and three authors. And I think we did enough research to help define that it was only one author. And, and, how, and, and uh, I think it was chapters 40 to 44 that were, were the real debatable issue, like it had been inserted somewhere, uh, I mean by somebody else. And, uh, but how God used that to reveal to the people that were in captivity right, the prophecies that were provided there. Uh, uh, so when we talk about dual authorship, we're not talking about multiple authors. 
we're talking about author capital A slash little a. Right? That's what that's what the dual authorship actually is identifying. It has the Bible has a divine author and it has a human author. And so when God spoke, he spoke through people. He spoke through human authors. But in that process, and I think this is the this is the just the marvel of God, is that he did not he did not eliminate their frailties and their weaknesses and their personalities and uh, just all of those different kind of elements that were a part of their life. I mean, we, we, I think we know somebody like Jeremiah was very different than somebody like Isaiah. And uh, that Paul was very different than somebody like Matthew. Um, you know, we just we know that there are differences there, and God never eliminated those differences when He actually uh, wrote it. Everybody has anybody that's writing. I have a certain style. Uh, you have a certain style in your class. Um, uh, we all have frailties. Uh, you know, we all have paradigms, right? And those paradigms have to be corrected, and hopefully that's what hermeneutics is going to help us to do, is to eliminate some of our paradigms. And, uh, but when the human authors wrote, and e even with all of the personal limitations that they had, I mean, if I, had, if I thought that God wanted me to write a, the Bible, I, I would be, I'd be scared to death. I mean, I, I would just be... It, it would it would it would scare the daylights out of me if 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 he had chosen you know one of us to, to to have written. But even with all their frailties and their weaknesses, they never distorted or misrepresented what God intended for them to say. Even though their personality may have been included in it, there was no distortion in in the actual message, and so. If we look at the Bible, it is a perfect representation of what God intended. And yet we can see, we can see in each one of them, each one of the books of the Bible, we can see the author. We can see the author's hand and that, that, that it's like we can see his DNA in the way that he wrote it, but it doesn't in any way diminish from from the accuracy and clarity of what God actually wanted to communicate. And I think what's unique, and, and maybe we ought to say it, what is divinely unique in the inspiration of Scripture is that God took the personalities <coughs> and the frailties and the weaknesses and the limitations and the paradigms and everything, and He fully integrated all that into the Scripture without diminishing the scriptures. I mean, that's a remarkable thing when you think about it, uh, that, God, that God could do that. But I think that's exactly, you know, what he did. And I think what's even more divine is that when you examine this subject, is that, is that the scriptures reveal this amazing unity among the authors. It's that they all spoke in a way that their all of their messages are unified with one another. There's not one author that's out of unity with any other author. There's no disunity among the authors. And yet, of the 40 authors, how many years? I mean, Moses was what? I mean, I don't, I don't even know what year Moses wrote. What, 2000 or something? And... and, and it's probably, you know, maybe it's, I don't know what the year he wrote, but, uh, you know, there's several thousand years difference between, I mean, out of different backgrounds, different cultures, different settings, different problems, different complexities, and yet there's no disunity among, among the authors. So they, they're never seen to be in contradiction to one another. And, and I think that when we look at that and we examine it, that it is 
it, I, I think it's what we would call that it's, it's a direct byproduct of the control and the influence that the Holy Spirit had in the entire process of God governing, controlling, overseeing every part of the scriptures in such a way that there was never any disunity among all of these different authors that lived at, at very different times. So it was understood by God. He knew what he wanted to achieve, and he used these people to be able to do that. I would say to you, in, in, in saying all that, that that doesn't imply that the authors understood what God was doing. And I think that's a very important part. I don't think that Amos understood everything God was doing through him, you know, when he, when he wrote that book, or Zechariah, or Malachi, or anybody like that. Uh, I just don't think that they, that they understood everything that was involved. The issue that arises in the area of dual authorship, of all things, it relates back to the question, of, to the issue of census planor, and the idea of whether or not there's only a single intended meaning in a, in a, in a passage. Uh, just the words, when we use, if I were to use the word dual authorship, just that idea that there's two entities that are involved in it kind of for some people seems to in their creative imagination you know to open up a door where there can be this this, this dual meaning in a passage protestant hermeneutics uh, protestant hermeneutics over the years okay has traditionally accepted the fact that every text only has one meaning uh, that's been the traditional Protestant position, but, and the way that the Protestants over the years, I, I think, I think we have to accept census planora. I mean, I think that we have to accept the idea that there can be a secondary meaning, as long as it's revealed by the Holy Spirit. But the way that the Protestants have communicated it, I mean, I, I'm, 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 I would be somebody that would be in that category, I think y'all would be too, is that even though it has one meaning, it can have multiple applications, and it can have multiple implications. And so, so when you add the idea of application and implication to meaning, what happens is that some people use that to glean or to develop a secondary meaning out of the passage that maybe it never really was intended intended to have. And so we might call it, I, I think the way the way that this is, and I think this is a bad word, I just I don't like the word, but I, I think the way that in Protestant hermeneutics it has been defined as sub meaning. And I don't like that word. I just don't think that's the right word. I, I can accept applications and I can, I can accept implications, but I don't think I can accept sub-meanings. That's, that's hidden meanings, double meanings, secondary meanings. And uh, I, I don't think that, I don't think that that position that it can have multiple applications comes close to satisfying the debate of census planora. It just does not satisfy it in those realms where those people debate about those kind of things. So I think it's generally accepted on both sides of the argument that what God may have fully intended in a passage is meaning certainly was not necessarily apparent or conscious to the author that wrote it. I think both sides would accept that as a, as a starting point in their, in their debate. So the debate centers more on the issue of whether or not the text only has one meaning and whether or not there can be a fuller meaning of the text that was designed by the divine author. I think the answer to that is yes. It has one meaning that can have a fuller meaning that God designed and that the original author didn't. And so the traditional historical grammatical approach postulates that the meaning, and I, I want you to, if you're taking, if, if you are appreciating what I'm communicating here, 
the historical grammatical approach is going to postulate that the meaning must absolutely has to come <coughs> specifically from the text itself through all of the conventional tools, rules, methodologies of biblical exegesis. I want to give to those, I'm going to give you five of, of those, all right? So you, you would write these down. These, these are the conventional practices. There's the grammatical approach. I, I, maybe approach is not the right word. There's just the grammatical practice. There's the historical practice, historical approach. There's the exegetical approach. There's the syntactical. Syntax is how sentences are arranged, word order, all those kind of things. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then literary methodologies. How things are generally written and, and perceived. So, what the grammatical historical approach recognizes and supports is that if the Holy Spirit reveals a secondary and fuller meaning, that that's acceptable. It goes that far, and I'm that, that's where I, that's where I fall, but just personally. No matter what the debate says, I'm, I'm a historical grammatical guy, but I know that there can be secondary meanings in passages revealed by the Holy Spirit. All right, I want to talk next about the historical grammatical approach and what it is. To me, this is at the heart of what we do. This is, this is, a, at the, this is a sort of a core value of hermeneutics. The new hermeneutic is, 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 if I can say it this way, the new hermeneutic destroys the value of the historical grammatical approach. It's going to de deflect us away from the actual meaning of the passage to what the passage means to me. Understand the difference. Not what did the passage mean, but what does it mean to me. And so the historical grammatical approach is a method that emphasizes the historical content and context of a passage and all of the linguistics of the biblical language itself. So that's why it's so important for us to become as much as we can with the tools that we have to become good, um, good students of Greek and Hebrew, right? I don't study that much in the Old Testament. That, that's not good or bad. And I just don't. I spend most of my time uh, in the New Testament and use the Old Testament as examples. That's not to say I'd be opposed to teaching a book in the New Testament. I wouldn't. I mean, the Old Testament. I, I wouldn't. Certainly, if I was going to teach any book in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, I'd want to teach Genesis. I think that would be the most important book to the, the book of beginnings to, to teach and it would probably be good to do that at some time. So when we think about the historical grammatical approach we have to realize that it is an approach that is in contradiction to what is oftentimes called the allegorical method of of, uh, of exegesis. And uh, it's, it is a methodology that is geared toward literal interpretation. Now, when I say literal interpretation, you have to just understand that, uh, that, that that takes into account figures of speech, typology, all right, uh, uh, symbols. You know, say that are given in, in a, in say like Ezekiel. Um, that that falls under the, uh, the allegorical 
that what you No, 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 no. I'm just saying the historical grammatical approach oh, okay. accepts that there are figures of speech figures where you cannot take a word literally. Okay, you can't just do the yeah, yeah, there's and, idioms and things. That's right. There, there's, there's all kinds of figures of speech that are available uh, for, for us to use. And it's just the normal way that we actually talk. So, I have to be, I have to be able to, to, to understand the historical context of the passage that I'm studying. I mean, the Old Testament is really critical. But there are passages like I'm teaching on First Peter now, and First Peter uh, talks more about suffering than any other book in the New Testament. It uses that, and Peter uses a, a distinct style that he uses the aorist imperative tense to facilitate and emphasize what it is that he's trying to communicate. So if I don't understand about persecution, when Peter wrote it, and that it was going to actually get worse once they destroyed Jerusalem, uh, and what was going to happen in the entire Roman Empire to make it even more difficult, then First Peter just will not make as much sense. In fact, the hardest part that I have in teaching First Peter is that of contextualizing the idea of suffering in a in a country where suffering. For righteousness sake, it, I mean, we have so many freedoms and religious freedoms that that it's it's just not something that that we are, that we experience on, on a regular basis. If you went to Pakistan, if you went to Indonesia, if you went to Saudi Arabia, you know, where where they will kill you. Uh, you know, I communicate to one of our. Um, students in uh, China on a regular basis, almost, you know, every two or three days we, we talk to one another and we have to be careful how we communicate things because they, they peruse the internet and different programs and look for different words. I have a guy that uh, is a missionary in Indonesia and he sends out a, uh, a newsletter, but he never uses the full biblical word. I mean, he wouldn't use the word God. He might use the word Father, and it would be F-T-H-R, you know, um, r rather than using the word Father. Uh, he, uh, he wouldn't use the word Church, you know, he would use another word. Uh, we gathered or something, he, he just, he's very careful because they're constantly, it, he teaches in a school and he uses that as his, uh, as his uh, sort of tent making, if I, if I can say it that way. So, uh, so let me give you a list of things that you're going to look for in the historical context. You have to understand their customs. It's very critical that you understand their world view at that time, their ideas about the world. You know, there were times when nobody thought the world was round, right? They thought the world was flat. There's some of them out there in the Yeah, there's some out there. I've heard, the, the, you know, the, the, the flat earth advocates and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, there are things like their paradigms that they had. They, they all had different paradigms. Um, I know that, for instance, uh, who was the guy that started the Mormon church? Joseph Smith. Huh? Joseph Smith. Yeah, Joseph Smith, that he advocated polygamy based on the fact that Abraham had more than one, you know, he had Hagar, and that was, you know, um, there was no actual historical scriptural statement at that time. You know, the Bible hadn't been written, the laws hadn't been written, uh, it, it, it was culturally accepted at that time. That doesn't mean it's culturally, it's biblically accepted now. In fact, 
if you study the story of Abraham, he was a, a pagan, he, right? He was a heathen down in the early Chaldees. He, he wasn't, you wouldn't want to base a Christian religion on a, on, on, on a pagan custom, right? Mm. And yet that's what many people do. Uh, there were locations. Uh, you know, one of the things that I really read about my Bible, and like, like, is that I don't have tonight in the class that uh, Caleb was teaching uh, biblical theology. He mentioned Mount Hor Horeb, and I was trying to find Mount Horeb in my maps, <laughs> and I just couldn't. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find where it was located. You know, and. Mount Sinai and all those kind of things. Yeah, I think it's in the Sinai Peninsula, right? <laughs> so I ought to be able to figure out kind of where it is, but, uh, you know, just understanding the location. Uh, I, I was talking to a student the other day, or, or I don't know if it was a student, it was somebody, and, and uh, it was a student, and they were expressing to me that for the first time in their life, they realized how far when Jonah went to Tarsus, that Tarsus was on the other side of Spain somewhere, and that, uh, where, where did he go? He went to, where did, he, where did God send him? Nineveh. Nineveh. That, that they were in the act, they were in the opposite direction. And they were completely as far away from one another as you could go, you know, he's, and, I, and I told him, I said, well, you know, I said, when the whale spit him out on dry land, it wasn't like he just was sitting at the front door of Tarsus, he, I mean, of uh, uh, Nineveh, he had a long way to go, he, he was cleaned up by the time he finally got there, you know, and I think they thought that that he, you know, he had seaweed all over him when he entered into the middle. But I don't think that was the case at all. So, um, there are beliefs that have to be taken into account. That, that's one of the terms if you're writing those down. Customs, ideas, paradigms, locations, belief, cultures. Cultures were different. Cultures are different today. I was—I uh, remember I never get when I was in Indonesia one time and we were up in the mountains had to get up to a tribe by helicopter. That was the only way we could get there. It would have been about a 12-hour trip on foot with no roads in the mountains if we were if we had gotten there any other way. And when they would do a baptism, I may have told you this before. When they would do a baptism. They would they would go downstream to the to the to the other tribes that were downstream from them and tell them at a certain time we're going to be baptized and, and so you don't need to be in the water because all of these people's sins are going to be washed away and if if you're in the water you could get their <coughs> sins. Now that's their culture. These are these were this is a Christian tribe. But that was their understanding of it, you know. And, uh, well, I've heard that they uh, gave certain respect to a missionary because his feet were bloody. His feet were bloody. Because he had walked, I mean, he, oh, yeah. he wasn't yeah. there. Yeah. 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 So there's just a lot of cultural things, you know, and if you've ever <coughs> taught in a second and third world country, uh, you know, when I go to, uh, I remember one time when Eddie and I were in, in uh, Zimbabwe, the, the, uh, we went into we went into a number of different villages, and I I stayed in a village called Chinja, and then the next village over, I don't even know where it was, but it was just the next village over. We didn't have a chance to go into it that week, and uh, because we it, it just took so long to go through the different villages, so we had four or five that we went through, and uh, the chief in the next village got very irate with us. I mean, he was he was mad at us, and basically said that we couldn't come to his village because we had ignored him. And what we told him was that we didn't ignore him; that we we were coming. We were just making our way up the river, 
And when we, we would get there, you, you know, and we had another team come in the next week and they would, they, they would come to his village and that satisfied him. But we could not have spoken to anybody in that village because it's a, they have a tribal uh, culture. And, the, and in the tribal culture, the chief, whatever he says goes and nobody questions it. It's one of the elder, elder men and so just a completely different culture. So all of these factors that I've given to you there, they're going to greatly impact how somebody perceives what the author was writing. Their culture is different, you know, uh, if their ideas, if their worldview is different, and which it was in most cases, it was going to impact how that person actually received what was being communicated. So my goal and your goal is to find out what the author meant when he wrote in that historical context, uh, what the text meant to his historical audience. The second aspect of the historical grammatical approach is that we have to examine all of the linguistic issues, all of the grammatical issues and aspects of the language, either Hebrew or Greek, right? We've just got to examine all the words, uh, the small words, the big words, the words that we think we already know. And we've got, to, we've got to examine them. I was studying today, I forget what the word was. Um, I was reading, that's what I was doing. I was reading in a book, and it was talking about, it was talking about how in the Greek language, um, how just one uh, letter Im impacted a word, and and uh, and it gave this example. I forget what the word was. It, it was written in Greek, and I, I just didn't read it. And 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 so you you, you had a a root word, and then you had a root word that had one less letter in it. It might have been. I, I think the iota was part of it. Uh, right, right. And uh, but it impacted the meaning and, and uh, of that of that word drastically. And you can't just you you can't just see that. I mean, you, you can't just read that uh, without d doing the linguistic study on on a, on a particular passage. To, to some degree, English has this, though. I mean, you could say someone is capable, and then if you prepend in, I-N, in front of that, it has a completely opposite meaning. Someone is, someone is incapable of fixing your car. Someone is capable of fixing your car. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who's, I, I, if that's, that's a poor example, perhaps. No, that's a great example. That's exactly what this was saying. It was just one letter. That you know, uh, you can put the letter A in front of some words in the Greek, and it, it's a, it, it's the negative prefix. Moral and amoral. That's right. It's just the negative prefix to that word. And uh, even in the Hebrew, if 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 I if I put up here, if I put, if you understood how words are written in the Hebrew, where they don't have they don't have vowels, and they're written backwards. Then you could write down, say, the word CT, that's the way that it is in Hebrew, I'm just making that up. That could be cat, it could be cot, it could be coat, it could be act, and I'm sure there are other things that it could be. Um, uh, it could be city, right? It, it, I mean, there, 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 there might be 20 words that you could get from that. Uh, so, how somebody interpreted that, whether it was coat or act, 
it's kind of a it's kind of an interpretive issue on, on the part of the person that's actually translating it. So there are there are there are going to be linguistic issues in the text, uh, even and I think it's in the in the Greek text. It really comes more from the parsing of the verbs and what case something is in, <coughs> as, as much as any as 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 much as anything, how that changes the meaning, active voice, passive voice, right? It just changes the meaning completely. Um, so, you know, it's just what did the words mean when the, when the guy wrote it to, to his audience? And uh, every, what is really interesting to me, and I think this is important, is that, is that, is that in every language, every language has nuances, right? Every, every, words have nuances of meaning. And the nuances vary. And it's, it's a place where it can be very, very dangerous <coughs> if, we, if, we, if we emphasize the wrong nuance of a, of a, of a word. I think when we were doing, you remember when we were doing our, our study on the introduction to Bible study, and we got to, we, we, were, we were looking up words in biblical dictionaries, say zodiates, and the word has, at the top, it has a meaning, and then it has Roman numeral 1, Roman numeral 2, Roman numeral 3, Roman numeral 4, Roman numeral 5, Roman numeral 6 on some words, and under every one of those, it may have an A, B, C, so that you've got to go find the meaning that, out of those six options that you're being given. And normally, they 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 would, and if if, they, if there are not many usages of that word in the New Testament, they've got you covered. Zodiates would say it was Hebrews two fourteen or something, and that was the one you, that was the verse you were studying. But if it's got 240 different places where it's used in the scriptures, you, it's, your, yours may not be there. Then you have to decide which one it's actually talking about. Right? Strong says the same thing. Uh -huh. Right. I'm just saying... That's what I thought of earlier when you said about how hard it is. It's hard enough. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> if, if, if the word is used a lot and it has multiple meanings... Your verse may not be there in, in, the, in the dictionary. So you're going to have to take some linguistic, you're going to have to use some linguistic judgment, right, as to what the, really, the, the meaning should be. That's when you would consult other commentaries to, to see what some of the experts felt like it, it, you know, it really was. So uh, there's meanings in the immediate context. I got to examine the syntax. Syntax controls all the rules about how a sentence is structured. You know, uh, we, we call it good English, right? You know, what makes for a good composition? I get so tired when I get papers and and it's and and it's poorly written. You know, it's not good English. It's just. People starting words and sentences with conjunctions, you know, they start a conjunction, you know, a sentence with but, and somebody's going to say, well, there are places in the Bible where it is, and I, I say, that's great, that's great. In the Greek language, that was fine. But in English, we don't do that, right? So, uh, I don't, you know, what the Bible did, I'm not, that's one thing, but what we do in English is quite another. So, uh, every, every language is different, that's the point. And, and Greek is different than English, and uh, Hebrew is, is just incredible, right? Uh, in English, word order is critical. I was uh, reading uh, those passages in like Exodus 7 or 15, 7, about Yahweh and El Shaddai and all that, and I looked in two 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 different texts, I mean two different interlinears, and both of them were different. I mean they, the word order in them was different. 
and the words, some of the words were different. Uh, I went back and looked up the first place that Yahweh was used, and it was in. It, it said that, and the, and the Lord God made man. I think that was the way it said, and it used the word. In one, it used the word Yahweh. Elohim. It was the Lord God, Yahweh, Elohim. And I think in the other one of the other trans text, it it was different. It was just Elohim or something. I forget. Hmm. So every language is different. The interlinears are different. Uh, word order is important. That's why in the interlinear, it's got numbers beside words, letting you know that in the Hebrew. This is where the word, is. I mean in Greek this is where the word is, but in English it ought to be over here. And so word one would come first and word two would come second and, and uh, it's just, it's very, very different. I would say to you that in the Greek and Hebrew word order doesn't mean nearly as much as it does in English. So. Yes, probably I was thinking, um, I don't know if you've seen this, but on, on Facebook I, a couple of times I've gotten this uh, little thing that says, uh, you know, if you're a, gen you, you're, you're a genius, if you can read this, you know, and it'll have some paragraph, and it'll have like a, some English paragraph, and it'll be missing all the vowels, or it won't right. have no spaces, or it'll be upside down or backwards. I can always read it. I'm, I'm not the only one, mm -hmm. but it's because we're we're familiar with English that you can take some of the letters out, and we because of the sentence structure, because of the words, we can read it. Because you, know, you can put it backwards, you can turn it upside down, and you know it may be a little more challenging, but we can read it because we're familiar with it. And the, the ones reading the Hebrew were probably the very that's right. similar. Oh, I think that's right. That was their language. Yeah. It, it was their you can language. take all the vowels out, it didn't matter. Right. You can still read it. Or right. put, don't have any spaces, that's okay. That's right. There's no punctuation, there's no period, there's no question mark. There's no some, some of the sentences I've seen, uh, they'll take, take the word, and the first letter and last letter will be correct, but the letters in the middle will be jumbled. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. And, and so. After a few seconds, you can you, you you just start, and and it's an indication that you look at the length of the word in the first and last letter, and then you understand the word without even thinking about the central context contents of it. Mm -hmm. I've seen that before, yeah. and maybe I'll see if I can't send send it to you so you can use that as an example. No, no, that'd be great. Right. Um. Now, I, I want you to think for a minute that what we're talking about here, this is where this principle of meaning kind of comes into focus here. Intended meaning, right? Um, authorial intent. This is where, the, under the historical grammatical approach, that's where meaning comes into focus. Everybody that teaches, anybody that teaches, whether it's online student or, or us in this, in this classroom tonight, we understand that somebody can get the meaning of the words right. And they can actually get the context right. You know, you can do, you can do your study, you got all, all, all the meaning of the words right. Um, and, 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 and you got the context right. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that your audience got it. Just because you did all the technical analysis and got that right. Let, let's go, everybody just turn in your Bible to John chapter 6 for me. John chapter 6 verse 53. Now I can get all these words right. All right, I can tell you what every word means. I, I, can, I can parse the verbs properly. But I'm not sure that I can fully communicate the meaning, all right? It says, then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Well, what do you do with that, you know? How does the historical grammatical approach, how does that work in that passage, you know? These are figures of, of speech here, you know, these are... These are terms that have got to be defined in a different way than just their physical meaning, you know. Uh, 
So the Catholics, I mean, they, they, they've taken these verses, right, and they, they've taken them literally, right? They say when they take communion that the, the wine turns into blood and the, and the little wafer turns into the actual body of Christ. I mean, that's the way they've interpreted that. I, to me, that's just, you, you can't do that. You can't handle the scriptures that way. So I can correctly and grammatically get everything right and tell my audience what everything means. And I know what the word drink means and I know what the word blood means. I have to be in Columbia at 8 o'clock in the morning to get my blood work done and then get my infusion that I get done every month. And But I, 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 I know what it means to drink. I've got, a, got some tea here. I'm drinking it, right? But you don't drink blood. And you don't eat somebody's flesh. So the meaning of that passage cannot just be determined by word meaning, right? Right, right. right. There, it's, there's something else here that, that's in this. So there's more to, to interpretation than just getting the meaning of the words correct. There's all kinds of figures of speech. There's hyperboles. There's parables. There's euphemisms. There's all kinds of... There's irony, there's metaphors, there's metatonomies, meta there's oxymorons, there's paradoxes, there's personifications, there's puns, there's similes. I mean, the list is really kind of endless. And so when you get to some of those, those kind of things, you cannot just take it literally. And that's one of the problems that some people have with the historical grammatical approach in that they think it has to lead you, it has to always lead you to a literal, a, a literal interpretation. And I would say 99%, 95% of the time it does, except when you get into these various figures of speech. But every one of the figures of speech have to be handled differently. So there have to be rules of interpretation as to how you handle handle these different, these, these different figures of speech that, that we have. Then there's the issue of intent, authorial intent, right? What did the author intend to say? Uh, what, what was the intended meaning? What, what was he actually intending to say in that passage right there? What was Jesus really trying to say? Was he trying to say he wanted everybody to drink his blood? I don't think so. Or, or to eat his flesh? I don't think so. Was he talking there about communion? Well, if he, if he meant that, then the disciples failed. Moreover, uh, there would be no chance for salvation for us. Right. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that we can give while we know that's not what he meant. But what did he mean? Right. I mean, that's the question. No, it's interesting is on, on the... Offices in Columbus, so I got a long drive back during the, some, some, some nights. And so I'm listening to the radio, and I was listening to a, a Catholic um, biblical teaching uh, show, show, talk show, where they had a guy, and he had a guest Catholic scholar, and they were talking about this very subject of the Eucharist this past week. And the Catholic scholar was expressing his concern that a certain percentage in a Pew survey, a certain percentage of Catholics, Actually, believe that baptism, or not baptism, the Lord's Supper or Eucharist was uh, had a symbolic meaning, and that um, they uh, that uh, like thirty something percent <coughs> did not believe in the transubstantiation taught by the church that the you know the body and blood was substantially present, and that it was a um, um, reflection of, of how do you say it? Um, he was concerned that people were denying the truth taught in script. Uh, the truth of Scripture is taught by the church. I think that was his exact words. Right, right. So the um, um, and that the church had done a poor job in their catechisms and teaching. And uh, but was what's interesting to me was that he, in his mind, the truth of Scripture taught that Christ's body, um, body and blood was in the Eucharist, where we would come and say, no, from a historical grammatical standpoint, that's not correct. But it's just interesting, the different, you know. But they would use this scripture to do that. I mean, that's one of their proof texts. Right. And they take it literally, right? Yeah. 
but they can't take it literally because they don't have his blood and they don't have his flesh, so they just say it turns in, in into it. Turns into it. So let's just let me give you an example. <coughs> this would be just this would be a very, very simple example. Now, it's really been hot this summer, and you know what it means to be hot. But somebody could come to you and say, "It was hotter than fire this afternoon." Well, it wasn't, right? It wasn't hotter than fire. Not here. It was 95, 99, you know, 101. But not hotter than fire. But everybody that heard that individual say that knew exactly what he meant. Fast as grease lightning. That's right. I've said that many times. Fast. How do you grease lightning in the first place? You can't. You can't. But everybody knows what you're saying, you know? Everybody knows exactly what you mean by those words, even though if you did took the historical grammatical approach, what what the historical grammatical approach does is that it it says that in that context, this is what this meant. If I said, let's say Larry's on a roof, he's doing roofing. And, and one of his guys said, it's hotter than fire up here. In that context, everybody knows what he's talking about. So you have to take the context into consideration. If somebody's, if somebody's inside uh, on a really hot day and they're working in a meat freezer, they're probably not going to say it's hotter than fire this afternoon. They, they're probably going to say it was as... It was cold as something, you know. People say they're freezing all the time. That's they right. were literally freezing. That's right. No, that's right. That's exactly right. My oh, wife, gosh. my wife says in church every Sunday, I'm freezing. I'm freezing. You're not freezing. It's 73 in here. You don't see no, icicles hanging all over. That's over. right. You're, nobody's no, nobody's freezing. Well, if she, if if they were freezing, they'd have frostbite. Frostbite. So or or something. So, so here's what we know. If if we wanted to write the words down that that we have to deal with, we know that there are things that are figurative, right? And then there are things that are literal. And we have to use our context and our grammar and all of that to, to define whether or not it's figurative. This is figurative, right? Right? Everybody say right. right. <laughs> this is figurative. This is not literal. This is not literal. This is figurative. And Jesus had the right to use figurative language. It was his way of emphasizing something about, about our relationship to him and, and where we got our, our life from. So we have grammatical, we have linguistic issues, we have syntax, we have all of these factors that kind of enter into the historical grammatical approach. All right, the next one that we want to look at, the next term is textual criticism. Textual criticism. I, this, is, uh, this is really a bigger issue, I think, than it's not something that, that affects me on a weekly basis when I'm studying. But there is a lot of controversy that, is, that surrounds textual criticism. I, I appreciate textual criticism. I think it's, these guys are, are you know, I'm up here at the 10,000 foot level and they've got a microscope looking at something, you know what I'm saying? So they, they're looking at something not, I think the, the guy that's a really good textual critic is not criticizing scripture. I, I don't like the word criticism. Maybe it ought to be textual. Do I sound negative? It does. It does. Textual evaluation. Evaluation would be, I think, would be the best way to say it. Textual evaluation uh, would be maybe a better term. But it's considered a science. Textual criticism is actually considered a science. It's not an art. And it it helps us to determine exactly what the original author's text or how the original author's text was meaning was written, uh, you know, you can put a, a diphthong or, you know, some of the jots and tittles that they have in the Hebrew language. All you got to do is just go to the 
interlinear and just look at the words and just how easy it would be to leap off one dot uh, uh, on, a, on some of their letters. But that one dot would have a, an impact on, on, on the meaning. Um, what would be a good example of that in our language? Let me see. It's the difference between a C and an O, right? I mean, you, you, I mean, but what if we left out? Let's see, A, B, C, well, how, D, E, Q. Would you take the little? What if we? Well, well, that's, that's well, it'd be like this. It'd be I like was, this. I was thinking of we, we like, can go. We could. We could write it that way, or we could write it that way. E F. Well, Stevens. Huh? Stevens. Stevens can be a name. Mm -hmm. Or if you say Stevens apostrophe, it could show possessive. Yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. Or I'm going to go over to the Stevens house. Mm -hmm. So S T E P H E N. Or go to Stevens house. Mm -hmm. Stephen apostrophe S. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the apostrophe could mean possessive or it could mean a location. That's what I mean. Right. No, no, I understand. I, I'm just saying. I'm saying that textual criticism might have one, it might have one uh, or two texts, I mean manuscripts, yeah. and they got 90 that were like this. And they, they're evaluating those kind of things and why it was written that way and why the scribes. I was reading something today where they were talking about how scribes were just like us, they'd get tired. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, Tom. Yeah. You read about that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they just get tired. And so. What I wonder about that, though, is, and I'm, of course, not a textual critic. I don't think I can sit down and do all that all day long. But I'm just thinking, there's only so many manuscripts. Had, hadn't they got it figured out by now? I mean, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Have they not gone through and figured all this out? Yeah. Why are they still textually criticizing? Yeah, well, what they call it, what they call it is that they call it the variance. All right? And then they, you know, what we talked about in the last class, that they have, they've, they've defined these variants, variants in three different categories. I don't have that in my notes. Uh, as to whether it's critical or non-critical or, you know, something that's essential or whatever. I forget what the terms are that they use. I probably ought to write that down, change these notes and, and write it down. Um, and for the most part, they should have all this figured out by now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you some, you know, some numbers here in a minute. Uh, Daniel Wallace writes that the goal and definition of textual criticism is the study of the copies of any written document whose autograph, that's the original, is unknown or non-existent for the primary purpose of determining the exact wording of the original. I thought your example of the the Declaration of Independence. It's probably housed in Philadelphia, you know, and if it's there, and we and, and that burned down and we lost it, we we know we still know exactly what it said, even though we wouldn't have it. So, uh, another example would be uh, the way Jehovah's Witness parse uh, the conversation on the cross. Mm -hmm. I say unto you today. And then there's an eventually understood, you'll be with me in paradise. Well, first of all, the word's not there. And second, the original language didn't have punctuation like that. Mm -hmm. So when you go and you arbitrarily move that comma, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. Not I say unto you today, eventually you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, it completely changes the meaning of the phrase, right. whether or not that comma is in the right place or even there at all. Well, I think that the, the critical differences are, are, are less than 1%, but there are over 300, it, it says 300 to 400,000 textual variants that they found, and they don't even have that many words in the New Testament. That's between all the manuscripts you're looking at. Right? That's right. Uh, over 5,000. 5,200 or something. I mean, I, I think there's other... I, I'm talking about the New Testament. And there are other, <coughs> other 
sources that they're used. There, there's other sources that they use historically other than just the manuscripts. But And all they're just trying to do is validate their conclusion to historical documents that aren't that aren't the Bible, you know, that aren't manuscripts from, from the Bible. I think that what they have defined is that the majority of problems that occur in textual criticism, the variants come from what they consider to be scribal errors, period. Just a, a scribal area. Uh, it's like when you're reading my notes, I have a spell check, but I still make mistakes. You know, it's like I can write the word as there, or I can write it as there. And sometimes my automatic spell check, it, 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 my, my, it's my, my grammar check will, will, will pick it up. But there are plenty of places in words where the word is spelled correctly, but it's not the word that I actually intended. And then there are plenty of places where I've left the word out. If you went through my notes, as I'm reading through my notes and preparing to teach it, and I'm reading, <coughs> there are places where I have written down where I made a mistake. If I, if I took this right here, um, I've just got things. I had an S on the end of understand, and I, I didn't want it to have an S. So I've gone across it out, changed it into original, and I just do that as a normal, as a normal practice, you know. So they didn't have a <coughs> computer and they didn't have printing press. A printing press and they might have been tired and didn't check it the next day. Who knows? So I can read over my notes and still miss it, right? It's it's my understanding that a scribe would read one page and he would write the page and then write that same page again and write that same page again. And that's how they would make multiple copies of a given document. Sure. And if he's misremembered it, or if he's like, oh, I remember the whole page now, and he writes it, and he misremembers it, and he's made 16 copies that are wrong now, is he going to throw those away, given the expense of parchment back then? Probably not. Probably, probably wouldn't. Yeah, I, I mean, was, yeah, he probably wouldn't. I was thinking you get to the bottom of your parchment, you know, your parchment, and then you, you, you put it, you put like an S on the end that was supposed to be there, and you go, oh, and you go, oh, well, it's close enough, and you go on to the next. You know, probably so. <laughs> Because it's and, uh, and, and, you have to rewrite the whole thing, you know. I guess. Uh, did Did you have juniors? Did you have senior scribes do this, or did you have junior uh, acolytes do this type of work? I don't even know the skill level of the people doing the copying, and and maybe the guy made a mistake and said, "Well, I better hide it before the the bastard comes and finds it," and and so he slips it into the done pile. Well, what, 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 what yeah. we know is that they had scribal errors. Right. And, and but the scribal errors are really easy to qualify. Trivial. Yeah. I mean, they're they're easy to qualify. That I mean, because you may have a hundred manuscripts and and you had one scribal error and you just throw it out. It's an it's an error. Right. So, I think that that what's important to appreciate though is that textual criticism is a science that has to develop guidelines and methodologies and principles that it operates from. And that is good. I, I like, I like the, that they have rules that they, where they make these kind of decisions. I, I don't know who does all this stuff. I'm sort of like you, uh, Caleb. I don't really care to... It's, I, it's not really going to impact the meaning, but I still think that we're grateful to have people like this that really want to get it right, so that we, you know, we have a way of kind of, kind of defending the naysayers. You, you know, that say the Bible is full of errors. It, it's not full of errors. It's it, this is the, probably the most well documented you historical know, document that there is. You'll say I've I've noticed something before, and I just kind of occurred to you, like a. If you're reading a textbook of any well, a novel or anything, occasionally you know you'll come across an error where the editor missed something or whatever, but you don't really care about it. You just keep on reading. But you know, as many times as I've read the Bible, and as many Bibles as I've bought, as many copies as I've bought, and how many Bibles I got on my shelf, just like you probably did, 
I have never read the Bible and come across in our English translation said, oh, there's an error. There's a mistake. Have you? I mean, I, I never have. What, what that shows me is that there's just very meticulous care that's put into it by whoever's sure. whoever's trying to get it trying to get it right. And I I right. think I've had I found one or two errors in in but it's 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 like it's like if I had five copies of the New King James, one of them was I mean they're all produced by different people and it had it, it had a, an error in it you know mm -hmm. where they left off an S or something. But it's rare, mm -hmm. and it doesn't impact me. You know, it just doesn't do it. Yeah, I was just, I was just, it just impressed me that it's just a that level of care that those uh, people who work in that field and the translators and the teams and they, they, they put into it. You know, I think, I think that I, I think what's critical uh, is that is that what textual criticism has really defined for us is that there's no doctrine of Scripture. There's not one single doctrine of Scripture that is dependent on a passage that is textual, textually disputed. Period. I, I mean, and even what would be disputed would be very minimal. I, I mean, it just would not... It's just still not going to have an impact on... on that says a lot too, Pastor, because it's probably the most heavily scrutinized and it analyzed. Is. It, no, it is. A lot of naysayers, as you know. I think what makes it worse for those guys is that, say, for instance, the Old Testament was just written in a form that is not not even normal to us, reading backwards. No, no, no. Uh, uh, vowels in it, you know, and there's plenty of examples in the hermeneutical books. I mean, you can read them. They're, they're, there's some in the Klein text where they just take a passage, and they were all capital letters. There weren't lowercase and uppercase, you know. There was no punctuation. And they write it backwards, and and you have to kind of read it and kind of make a determination. I mean, you can read it. I mean, they give you the act the way it's interpreted, and you know what it is, but. The way it was written was very, very different than, than you know the way that we do it. We wouldn't even recognize it, and so that that makes it even a little bit more difficult. Uh, I, I use an example here: if the letters, if if there were the letters B T, we could get the word bat, bet, bit, bait, bite, or boat, just from those two letters. So there has to be some interpretation along the way as to what the word actually meant. So in this science, the textual variants are broken down into three categories. All right, let me give them to you. These are the, these are the words I said I didn't have in the notes and I lied. The first category is insignificant. This is important. This is, this is really important. Insignificant. The second category is significant but not viable. It's significant, but it's not viable. It's not going to impact anything. And then the third one is meaningful and viable. And so the vast, vast, vast majority of the variants occur in the first two. Um, I, I did a little bit of research on, on the name John. And if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> uh, the word John can be spelled multiple ways. It's like Stephen can be S-T-E-P-H-E-N or S-T-E-V-E-N. It doesn't really matter. I mean, I mean it does, but it doesn't. And then there was a, uh, there was a passage that I studied. It said... I'm going to make this up. I, I, I forget what it was. It was like John, <coughs> John knew Peter, or John loved Peter, or Jesus loved Peter. Maybe that's what it was, something like that. And that, and that, that little phrase, those three words, Jesus loved Peter, could be in the Greek, could be translated sixteen. It had sixteen different ways 
that that could be expressed. It's like if, if I said to you, we, we could say the car is red, or I could say that is a red car. The meaning is the same, right? It's a red car. That is a red car. You know, it, however I said it is not really the issue. And so there are plenty of places, there were places where the meaning was not in question, but how one scribe wrote it, he may have just sort of transliterated it or said it, he used a, another word or left a letter out or did something like that, but the meaning is still exactly the same. Jesus loved Peter. And so the, the, the meaning just didn't change. And so um, I think the things that are, the, are to, to me that are the most difficult is those passages like in Mark at the end where there's a whole passage that's left out. Uh, Mark 16, 9 through 20, John chapter 7, verse 53 through chapter 8, verse 11. And that's about the woman that was taken in adultery, if I'm not mistaken, in John. Right. It's about the woman that was taken in adultery. And that passage is left, I mean, it's, it's debated as to whether or not that should even be in the Bible. Well, I like the story, and I like the ending <laughs> of it, so I'm going to leave it in there. But that's just one of those areas of textual it, it areas. Doesn't, it doesn't change or detract how Jesus interacted with people. It doesn't. It's, it's exactly how Jesus interacted with people. That's right. So if it, if it contradicted, if it was totally aberrant, then right, you would say this probably doesn't belong. We're going to address a little bit, just a little bit, uh, the different kind of uh, texts that are used. There's the what's known as the Byzantine text or the Western text, the Textus Receptus. The King James is, is you, it uses the... Erasmus. No, it, the, the King James uses the Textus Receptus. And some of the modern translations, they use the... The Textus Receptus is the text of the older manuscripts. And the newer, a lot of the newer versions, like the ESV, the New American Standard, they use the older text rather than the than, I mean, I mean the older <coughs> manuscripts to develop their text. And we'll talk about that later, but it's not going to really that's why I have two manuscripts, I mean two interlinears that I use. And they both are different I mean they there are are differences in them because they come from different texts, you know, different manuscripts. Alright, I'm gonna stop there. Can I use your pen just a minute? <coughs> uh, <coughs> Thank you. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, we uh, thank you again for tonight, and just for these issues that we've studied. And some of them may seem trivial to others, and yet all of these things impact and have a, some kind of effect on how we study. And we pray that we, as we go about our week, as we begin to handle the scriptures, as we prepare to teach others, that we would not in any way dismiss any of these issues. They're all important. They're all significant. They have, they they will have an impact on how we interpret and handle the scriptures. And so we come to you and we just pray and ask that as we continue through this course that you would protect us, teach us, encourage us, and build us up in our faith that we can be good expositors of your precious word. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray.